Good morning, friends. This is Tony from Historic American Homes, back again with the next episode in our little series on designing a mid-century modern inspired small home using SketchUp Pro and Layout. I'm going to keep this video quite simple today. We're just looking at um, exterior finish options. What kind of op what kind of materials were typically used in mid-century modern homes? Um, what's available today? And why we might pick a, one over the other? A few a few little bits of, about detailing to make them look good. This is a fairly large topic, and I could go into quite a bit of detail on any one little piece of it, which I'm not going to do today because I want to keep this video reasonably compact. Maybe in the future I will pick out bits and pieces of this uh, to go further. So if you have any specific questions about any of the things I touch on here, drop them, drop those questions in a comment and let me know, and I will come back with more information on it. So let's uh, take a quick look at, um, let me pull up some pictures here. Like I said, I'm going to be keeping this really simple today. I'm not on no fancy, no fancy graphics or anything. Let's start with Frank Lloyd Wright. Pretty much all starts with Frank Lloyd Wright. This is the Jacobs, Jacobs house, Herbert Jacobs. Forgive me, I don't remember the name of the wife of Herbert Jacobs at the moment. Anyway, he was a... Um, he and his wife were, I think, university professors on a modest income, came to Frank Lloyd Wright in, I think, the year was 1934, and said, can you design us a home we can build for $5,000? And this dovetailed perfectly with what Wright was interested in doing with his career at that point, which was shifting from high, uh, high income clients to middle income clients, because he figured out there were a whole lot more of them and wanted to address the needs of everyday Americans in his home. So when Jacobs came along, he said, absolutely, I can do that. And that was the birth of the Usonian house, which eventually became our uh, the, the grandfather of our suburban houses. Um, right in Jacobs' house, the first one, 1934, Wright combined two materials. Um, Let's see, I think the wood was cypress. I'm not 100% certain about that. I know he used cypress on quite a few of them. So this horizontal siding system that he developed combined with structural masses in brick. The brick was basically the structural part that held the roof, and these, and these wood walls were effectively just screen walls. They could actually build the brick, build the roof, and then come in after and build the walls. So that's Sir Herbert Jacobs' house, and he really set the he really set the standard there with the Jacobs' house and this idea of combining um, two contrasting materials. Uh, that was 1934. So let's go to the next house here. This is Richard Neutra, who worked briefly for Wright when Wright was doing some projects in Southern California. Uh, Neutra studied with Wright, worked as his apprentice for a short time. I'm not sure, maybe two or three years. Um, oversaw the construction of several of Wright's Southern California homes, and then went on to start his own practice and became extremely influential over the 40s and 50s, particularly in, in the Southwest, but all over the country, really. He got attention all over the country. This is one of his Palm Springs homes, built in 1937. I don't remember. Miller House, there you go. And uh, he used a lot of concrete and stucco in Southern California, that being a very appropriate material to use for the climate. So you don't usually see a lot of stucco in uh, mid-century modern homes, but when you do, it's typically handled uh, like this. So let's see what else. Let's move forward a little bit more. Here are a couple of, of advertisements from the 1950s. Uh, where again we see that the basis of the exterior design um, is uh, contrasting materials. In this one, we have two materials handled three different ways. We have a, a brick base, kind of solid base that ties everything to the ground. That masonry is also, that brick is also used as the one vertical accent in the entire design, which is the chimney. And then the wood is used both horizontally and vertically, which gives it a kind of a nice little uh, contrast and play between vertical and horizontal lines in the design. It's predominantly a horizontal composition, that strong break between the brick and the wood. 
and these repeated horizontal lines of the horizontal siding. But then you've got that vertical accent of the chimney and it's kind of echoed in the vertical pieces here. Here's another ad from the same period where again we have a combination of brick and siding. In this case the siding, it looks like a board and batten type siding. Uh, same with the brick chimney accent and they've carried the brick up to the entrance. They've treated the siding at the entrance a little bit different to kind of mark out the front door. Oh, let's go a little further. Now we come to Joseph Eichler. I will read directly from my notes here. That's not the house. That's not the picture I wanted. That's the picture. One of the major developers who influenced the taste of the 1950s and 60s was Joseph Eichler. He turned to such architects as Claude Oakland and the firm of Anshin and Allen for many of his projects. Eichler's houses were mostly for the mid-priced market. So his material choices were simple, off-the-shelf products such as standard brick, concrete block, and especially grooved plywood siding that gives the effect of tongue and groove boards. Here we see the grooved siding combined with a standard concrete block laid up in a stack pattern. We'll come back to that stack pattern with brick later on. It's a pattern, it's um, where the brick or the blocks are simply stacked with the vertical joints aligning. This was very rarely done before the mid-century modern period because in an actual structural masonry wall, uh, typically it reduces the strength of the wall to use that type of bond. In this particular house, this is a structural block wall. These concrete blocks are holding the roof up. They're not just a veneer. So yeah, it actually does make the wall a little weaker. Uh, but in the case of a house like this, there's so little load on it that it's not important. It's not an important uh, reduction in strength. So stack, stacked concrete block bond and vertical siding. Let's take a little, I'm going to jump ahead here and take a little segue over to EichlerSiding.com. Uh, this is a company, I think they're California based, that specializes in um, reproducing the precise types of siding that Eichler used in his houses because it's not readily available any, anymore. Um, they, they match the width of the groove, the spacing of the grooves. Um, so if you're re-siding an Eichler house and you want to make, and you just want to do a patch, you can, you can go to Eichler siding. If you're determined to do a really accurate recreation from scratch of a mid-century modern house, then yeah, this would be a great siding to use. Uh, stuff looks great. Uh, another possibility is um, just the standard, uh, well, I'm jumping ahead. I'll, I'll come back to that. Let's, let's look at a few more pictures. Sorry about that. The tea in my cup here is only just starting to kick in. It's morning in my time. Let's see what we've got next here. This is another period uh, example. Um, this is also Eichler. The architect is Anshin and Allen, same as the previous uh, picture. And again, we see the siding. This is a wider spaced um, groove and a wider groove. This is more like the T111 that I was just going to start talking about. T111 is a standard off-the-shelf siding you can get at any home improvement store. And this image here looks very much like T111. Uh, Anshin and Allen, 1952. Now let's see what we've got next. Here's another uh, Eichler house, this one designed by Claude Oakland. It's a little difficult to see in the photo, but we've got the same type of, of siding with the vertical, with the vertical uh, grooves. And um, Claude Oakland has a bit of fun with it by transitioning to a screen of made of wood battens that are closely spaced so that it's the same material as the wall wood, painted the same color, but it gets a different rhythm. And that was his way of generating a little interest in the facade. Uh, again, just using very inexpensive stock materials. You can see the framing in the roof above behind where you get to actually see the roof joists. And again, that, that narrow, those narrow horizontal parallel lines, excuse me, those parallel lines closely spaced Kind of repeat the rhythm of these battens. Okay, let's move on to stone here. We're 10 minutes into this. Um, if you're enjoying this, I hope you'll take a moment to click the like button and subscribe. Uh, the 
I've, this is like the 11th or something in a whole series I'm doing on the design of this small mid-century modern house. And you'll find a bunch of earlier videos on it uh, covering more of the larger design aspects, not so much the detail. I'm starting to delve into some of the detail now. Anyway, uh, let's move on. We will look at stone. Definitely very important. Let's see what my notes here. Stone was a favorite for fireplaces, and frequently the interior of the chimney mass would be clad with the same stone as the exterior, blurring the division between indoors and outdoors. I want to add here, I didn't put this in my notes, you will also often find in, in interiors things like planter boxes separating, say, the entryway from the living room, and these planter boxes would be another opportunity to use that same masonry material as a way of linking the interior of the inside of the house to the exterior. Back to my notes. Although stonework of all kinds can be found in mid-century modern homes across the country, certain styles of stonework were more popular. In this photo we see one such style, a markedly horizontal coursing of thinner stones. Here you see some thin stones here, lots of thin stones, with the occasional thicker stone mixed in. So there's a thicker stone, there's a thicker stone. And the dimensions, the vertical dimensions align. They, they were carefully um, chosen to, to match the horizontal lines of the mortar joints between the stones, the grout joints between the stones. The style was frequently carried out with red sandstone. That's a, it was a very popular type of stone. Although, of course, stone is a regional material, and so you will find different stones are used in different parts of the country. But this sort of horizontal approach was one very popular approach to stonework in the 1950s and 60s. Another was a rubble stone. Here we see the rubble stone. Now this looks to me like it's a, an actual structural stone wall, or maybe stone in front of, of a concrete block. Sometimes you can see that the wall itself is actually a framed wall, and the rubble stone is laid up in an even more random looking pattern than this. Standard brick was very commonly used, but thin bricks, such as these, had a special appeal. By the way, if you own a home with brick or are considering using it, um, I'm going to include a link in the cap in the description. To, it's a link to a blog that somebody writes about mid-century modern homes, and she has lots of good advice to offer about brick, in particular its maintenance and care. She's an adamant, she adamantly insists people should never paint the brick on their mid-century modern homes, and I'm inclined to agree. The brick that was used on those houses was not designed, not made to be painted, and painting it can cause problems. Um, if you're building a new house inspired by mid-century modern and you like the look of painted brick, there are bricks available there where that's uh, appropriate. But don't just randomly start painting any brick you see. Let's go to the next picture here. I really like this entryway. There's the front door under this nice shaded porch. We've got this chimney mass here, uh, giving a vertical accent to kind of mark the entrance. And then we've got this solid wall here. And this is, again, the, the stack bond that I mentioned earlier. So we see that the, the vertical joints between the bricks all align. This is a particularly nice use of the stack bond to fit with the composition of the, uh, of the house itself. Now let's, uh, these were all original mid-century modern homes. Now let's move ahead to what, what we could do today. Here we're looking at a new house um, using a brick veneer combined with a wood, wood board and batten system. Looks like cedar, I think. Uh, this would be a four inch brick veneer. So you can get brick or stone typically in a roughly approximately four inch thickness. It usually has a one inch gap between it, behind it, and the wall, and the wood frame wall behind it. So you're looking at five inches total um, in front of the wood framed wall. This is something that needs to be considered when you're designing your house. The detailing of where the brick meets other materials has to account for that five inches. So for example, you see here at the windowsill, with the way the brick is projecting out at the windowsill. Here you've got two different sidings, two different finished surfaces side by side. We've got the board and batten next to the brick. 
Now, when this house was built, it was probably built with a, a wood framed wall behind this whole thing, and then the siding and the brick were applied afterwards, which means that the brick being thicker than the wood siding, it's going to project out more than the wood siding. So you're going to get into issues like up here where they meet up at the top, down here where they meet at the bottom, that need to be um, thought through so that they look good when the, when the work is done. Here it looks as if they have actually furred the wall out so that the wood siding projects out beyond the face of the brick. Uh, that way they don't have that ledge uh, of brick exposed. There's nothing wrong with having that ledge exposed, but it does become a waterproofing issue that requires a little more attention. Uh, more about brick here. So an alternative to full thickness brick or stone is to use one of the thin systems. Thin brick or, th or sto thin stone veneer. These can be down to as thin as a half an inch. They're typically between a half an inch and maybe an inch to an inch and a quarter. Um, but uh, let's say probably one half to three quarters inches is pretty typical for, for the brick. Now, Eldorado stone, which I mentioned in another video, uh, makes uh, cast stone, so it's not real stone, it's, it's cement-based material, but they make cast stone veneers and they make uh, thin brick. And they're the only company I know of that makes what I consider a uh, good-looking uh, um, cast stone material and I am happy to use them on my projects. I'm getting nothing from them by the way I'm not affiliated with them in any way, but they make a very nice product and it's the only cast stone I would use uh, On a project of my own design So here we're looking at some of their brick now these bricks are actually very thin maybe three quarters of an inch or a half an inch thick and they're actually applied rather like stucco uh, a, a coarse stucco first coat is put on the wall with the wire mesh just like stucco has and that first coat is grooved with while it's still uh, wet um, and then once it has a chance to set up for a few days um, these thin bricks are bonded to the surface with a cement mortar the advantage of this couple of advantages of this it's less expensive to apply than a full-size brick it's also not that four to five inch thickness that we were looking at in the previous picture so you don't have some of the water proofing issues that have to be resolved with um, full-size brick uh, it's not as heavy uh, so it's a little less labor disadvantages are that if you do if you lay them up poorly uh, and don't pay attention to detailing places such as corners it looks like a thin surface and that can be kind of disturbing you expect brick to look solid and thick so you got to pay attention to detailing it eldoradostone.com check out their website here's uh here's some of the horizontal stone work that they use that um is quite uh nice i should mention these, these are what they call nationwide profiles but they actually also have made um cast stone based on regional stone where they find actual examples of regional stonework and then use those as a basis for their cast stone. So, you know, if you live in a particular car, part of the country that has a certain stone that's prevalent, you may well find that you can reproduce that look using one of these cast materials. I mentioned corners. Um, so here's a picture from Eldorado Stone's uh, technical um, booklet that shows um, how to, how they make special stones to be used at outside corners to give you the thickness on both faces uh, that give it the sense of mass that a proper stone or brick wall would have. So we got a sneak peek at this picture earlier. I My picture seemed to have gotten out of order. This one should have been with the thin brick section. Now I, I brought this picture up because it's a, it's a new home I'm not certain whether it's thin brick or full-size brick. Uh, it could be either. It, it This could have been done with thin brick, very carefully detailed and properly, yeah, properly detailed, uh, treating the corners right, building out the thickness of the wall here so that the brick, the thin brick laid up against it um, gives a realistic dimension to the wall. No, I, like I said, I'm not sure whether this house actually used thin brick or not. It may be full-size brick, but it's an example of um, what thin brick would look like if it was done uh, properly. 
This is a newer house. I don't have the details on, unfortunately, I don't have the details on who designed this house. Um, I just found the picture without any reference in online. I did, I do have references for all the other pictures and I put all of this into a blog. So I'm going to link the blog in the description and if you're interested in looking up the references for any of the images you see here, uh, you will find them on the blog. Now let's jump ahead to continue from where we were. Yeah, from, so we ended at corners here. So that's uh, something to pay attention to if you want to go the thin, the thin stone or thin brick route. Now another thing to consider is the possibility of stone or tile using stone in the form of a tile. Here we see slate. This is natural slate, but instead of instead of it being instead of the stone being applied like stonework, it's being applied like tile. And and when you look at that, you know it's tile. You, you know it's thin. And so you don't have to you don't have to detail it to make it look thick. Compare the compare the image below with that with the image above. This material, this look of the of the surface, you know that's meant to be thick material, and so you need to wrap it around the corners and actually make it thick. Whereas with the tile work, it's okay if it looks like tile because it is tile, so it, it's it's logical looking. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next topic here, which is transitions between materials. Reading again from my notes, transitions between materials are key to making an elegant design. How does one material end and the next begin? Why are there two different materials? There should be a reason. Use materials to emphasize functional aspects such as a, such as a stone accent wall indicating the main entry or brickwork extending the fireplace and chimney mass to the exterior. Perhaps the lower portion of the wall up to the windowsill height is treated with a more splash resistant material such as slate tile while the wall above has wood siding. I, I would add here to my notes, you know, for example, it would look really weird to put wood siding from the ground up to the windowsill and then transition to thin brick or a veneer stone on top. You would not want to put the heavier looking material, the stone or brick, above the lighter material, the wood siding. So there should be a logic behind the transitions they, they don't, so that they don't appear arbitrary. In this picture, um, Let's see. Yeah, this is CTA Builders, CTA Design Builders, this picture. We have an excellent handling of all three elements listed above. The more expensive and visually striking material, full section cedar siding laid in a board and batten style, draws the eye to the entry. The transition in the same plane to the right of the photo logically happens at the trim, at the window trim. To the right, of the entry door materials transition at an inside corner uh, here inside corner where the edges can be concealed easily at the left corner closest to us this corner here the horizontal siding is detailed with a mitered corner which maintains the horizontal emphasis around the corner this horizontality wrapping around the corner provides a playful contrast to the vertical emphasis of the board and batten. We'll see some more pictures of that here in a moment. Here are some other examples of how to handle a corner where the, win where the horizontal siding is used. In the first example, again, the horizontal line of the siding is emphasized by wrapping it around the corner. To achieve a tight joint, Pieces of sheet metal are bent at an angle and applied with each course of siding. You can see there's a very faint line. That would be the transition between the sheet metal and the siding. This is an effective and inconspicuous solution when the siding is to be painted. So if the siding were to be um, wo uh, natural wood finish, then you would the sheet metal would be quite glaringly uh, different looking than the wood and uh, would not really not look very good. If it's going to be painted, it's all fine. If it's going to be uh, wood with a natural finish, then you're probably going to need to go through the extra labor of lapping the corner, uh, lapping the corner pieces um, to close the joints properly. It's, it's quite a bit more effort and requires quite a bit more skill. It looks gorgeous, but it comes with a cost. Now let's see what we have next. 
In this example, we have a similar approach with thin stone or cast stone veneer used at the entry. I'm fairly sure this is a cast stone veneer, quite thin. Uh, ending logically at an inside corner and at window trim. So the, the trim of the windows provides a suitable end for the stonework. And again, the transition happens at an inside corner. Horizontal, the horizontal siding receives that same treatment of the sheet metal pieces wrapping the corner. In this example, we have a different corner treatment, a piece of vertical trim. You can see it right here. That wraps around the corner. The effect of this is to break the horizontal line of the siding and emphasize flat panels of material. So we read this as a rectangular panel as opposed to horizontal lines of siding that wrap around the corner. This introduces a composition of vertical rectangles in contrast to the horizontal lines of the siding. So quite a different effect just by virtue of having that little piece of trim at the corner. A lot of builders like this type of trim, corner trim, because it makes their work a lot easier as far as cutting joints and fitting pieces together. Now, uh, but it does very much have a uh, very different effect, a uh, very different look than wrapping the siding around the corner. So you have to decide whether the convenience of your builder uh, versus what you're going to live with for the next 20, 30 years, is, you know, that's up to you. In this example, following a more contemporary approach not commonly seen during the heyday of mid-century modern design, we have continuous sheath of vertical sidings, suppressing geometric compositions and focusing on the surface qualities of the material itself, its natural colors and textures. So I would say this kind of this kind of this approach to, to siding, uh, it suppresses, it's not a question, it's not a matter of composition so much as it is the surface quality of the material. So this is a material that's got a lot of a lot to offer in terms of surface quality. It's very lively. Um, if this were painted, it would look, in my opinion, it would probably look hideous. You know, you would lose, you would lose completely the aesthetic pleasure that this material offers, and there would be nothing else to replace it. So, uh, something to keep in mind: painted versus not painted. Um, I will touch briefly on a lower cost option than the above examples. One that can be very much in the spirit of original mid-century modern design, but one that must also be detailed very well if it is to avoid appearing flimsy and cheap. Eichler, in his California projects, very often used grooved plywood. We saw that in the earlier photos. He used a variety of section profiles with grooves ranging from 1 8 to 3 8 of an inch and spaced from 2 1⁄2 to 10 inches apart. Uh, these can be seen in the earlier photos. Uh, what we're seeing here is a stock siding called T111, uh, which originally, it's my understanding, it was originally called T111 because the groove was an inch thick and then the and then the wide face was 11 inches thick. Now there seems to be a, more than a one um, pattern available um, in the homes improvement stores, but that's still generically called T111. Let's move on. Here's uh, an example of what not to do with T111. If its weaknesses are understood and designed for, it can offer a very cost-effective solution to siding a home. Typically, it comes in four foot wide sheets, eight feet long. Some stores carry longer sheets. 10 feet is um, usually available. Dimensional limitations should be considered when using this material. Give extra thought to the layout of the sheet on the wall, especially with regard to door and window opening. When working with materials like board and batten siding, it is possible to cheat the spacing of the boards to end up with good alignments of boards at window edges. But with grooved sheet siding, such as T111, there's no possibility for that kind of adjustment. So other steps must be taken to make a satisfying finished result. Note in the photo how not to do it. On either side of the window, the board widths are quite different. Compare this side where it looks to be about three inches with this side where it looks like it's at least six or maybe more. Also note that an eight foot sheet length results in the need for thin horizontal flashing line. You can see it here and you can see it here. 
Uh, sheets up to 10 feet in length are usually available. 10-foot sheets used at the window would have reached from would have reached to the eaves. It could have gone from the ground up to the eaves with a single sheet and avoided that line. Uh, another thing, uh, another problem with the above installation is that the sheets come close to the ground, right down to the brick here. The sheets are most prone to water damage. This is where the sheets are most prone to water damage. This is very common type of damage seen with P111 siding. And it's not because there's anything wrong with the siding, it's because the siding is being misused. It's an inappropriate material to use in that condition. So let's go back here. Um, the sheets could have been left six inches up from the ground, so ending up here. And a piece of pressure treated two by six wood trim could have separated the sheets from the ground. So they could have put a two by six horizontally all the way across the bottom and then brought the siding down on top of that. And that would have protected the siding from splash and from contact with the ground. If that piece of wood trim were pressure treated, it would probably last for decades. And even if it didn't last for decades, it would be quite easy to replace if it should get damaged and the siding would still remain intact. This blog post is not intended to provide full details on how to handle such waterproofing issues, but simply to raise people's awareness with regard to the potential problems so that you may seek more detailed solutions if you choose to use these materials. Used properly, they can last for decades. Used improperly, they, look, they can look like a mess in three to five years. Used properly, they are an excellent solution for do-it-yourselfers. Here's a couple of people making a treehouse using T111. Yes, so as I said at the start of this video, this subject of, of siding a house is way too large to fit in a short video. But I do hope that by making this, you'll have some ideas of um, consequences of your choices in terms of you know, what you need to plan for, if you, depending on which route you go. I brought up the T111 and gave this much space to it because I believe that it's a material that, if it is used correctly, can be very um, cost effective for a start. You'll save plenty of money, and that may free up a little money so that you can do something special somewhere else, like have that nice brick veneer around the entry or your brick fireplace um, chimney and your chimney and your fireplace wall. So when you're planning your project, Think about using your budget in that way. Maybe maybe a more cost-effective material like T111 works in most of the parts, and then you can give that little extra cash uh, where you can get the most benefit from it. One last and very important resource to mention with regard to contemporary materials is James Hardy, one of the leading manufacturers of exterior finished materials for homes. They make a variety of siding and trim materials using fiber cement, and designed to fit a range of home styles. Some of their sheet siding materials and their board and batten materials work well with the mid-century modern aesthetic. Check out their website to see a full range of choices. They can be ordered pre-painted with their paints being covered by the warranty. This can be reassuring to some homeowners. As with El Dorado Stone, I'm in no way affiliated with James Hardy. Here we see, in this image, we see Hardy panel used on this section of the, of the facade. Hardy panel comes in four foot wide sheets with a variety of textures. It can be used in combination with batten material to give a board and batten effect, or it can simply be used to create large unbroken surfaces. By unbroken, I'm saying, you know, with a four foot limit, the width of the sheet is four feet, so you do have a, you do have a, a break in the surface. The example in the photo shows something in between with battens that appear to be about two feet on center. That's probably a single four foot sheet there. And then another piece here, another piece here. Everything carefully aligned so that it's, the joints happen symmetrically at the window opening. If going this route, consider carefully where the joints between the sheets will appear on the elevation and try to get them to align with other elements of the design. Let's take a quick peek at a couple of web websites. I have um, the James Hardy website here Products, Hardy Panel. Um, Hardy Panel, you can get it with the, with the same look as the T111, with a wood texture or with a smooth surface. They also have panels that have a kind of stucco-like 
uh, texture. Using the smooth surface, you can combine that smooth surface panel, a four foot wide sheet, with battens from their, uh, oh, which section is it? I don't recall now, maybe it's hardy trim. Uh, in, the, in their trim section, they have a lot of different uh, sections, dimensions of, of wood to do things like eaves, um, rakes, window and door trim, Here we're looking at um, the hardy, the hardy trim section, and they have. There we go. It took a while. Inch thick trim, three three quarter inch, full inch, smooth textured. All of these different sizes of boards and battens. These can be combined with the hardy panel material to make a board and batten effect. Another website that's just a quick peek is Eldorado Stone. I mentioned them earlier. You can see up here under products they've got variety of, they've got brick, uh, they've got it in a range of um, colors, I like that white brick, that's quite striking. Anyway, I think that covers everything, I'll end this video here, please do leave comments, leave questions, I'll try to answer them. Hit the like button. I'd love it if you subscribed. Go back and look at the uh, playlist for, that this video is in. I've got the entire design of the house from the first steps up till now in that playlist, and I'm going to keep on adding to it. I've got some other videos on other topics. I'm doing all the work in SketchUp uh, and the companion program called Layout. So if you're interested in SketchUp and Layout, also leave questions about that. Uh, this is not intended to be a sketch. Uh, these videos aren't intended to be real SketchUp tutorials per se but I am covering some, some little tips uh, and techniques for SketchUp. Anyway, that's it. Enough of this. Uh, have a great day. I hope you enjoyed the video. Come back for more. Bye-bye.